This is Mikey Mason, and you're listening to Why We Game. I'm Brodor, and my guest this episode is author Aaron Dean. Aaron, how are you? I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks so much for having me on the the podcast. So as an avid board gamer, how have you been coping with COVID in the inability to get out there and essentially see people socially in, in larger groups? How is that going for you? Well, I'm very lucky where I have a small group that I still get together with every Friday night. Um, you know, we do keep it on the smaller side. We used to game every Monday and Wednesday at a local board game store, Miniature Market. I know you're aware of that. Luckily, I've had a small group where I've been able to accommodate them uh, here at my home. But definitely for those first couple months when the pandemic took off, it was definitely, I missed it. Yeah, know? it's it's challenging, right? Because I'm in the same boat. I have, uh, as, as pretentious as it sounds, I sort of have this elite inner circle of friends who we're all very obsessed about our contact tracing, who we're seeing. We're all very open with whom we've had contact with. We've all had COVID tests. We've had a couple scares in my group, but man, it's, it's challenging. And for me as a gamer, and I don't know if you feel this way, but the social aspect of it is an important part to me. So COVID's been a real kick in the, in the groin. Yeah. And I mean, for that first couple months, you know, I was kind of making do with playing on like board game arena, you know, like online version of Castles of Burgundy or what have you. But then I kind of did the same thing where I just kind of had an open dialogue with some of the people I game with the most. And, you know, we're trying to be as safe as possible. But yeah, there's for everyone who's not able to, you know, play physically, it's definitely a different feeling for sure. And there's some, there's a missing element for sure when you're not playing face to face. So you're, and again, I do not say this as a denigration. I say this as envy. Uh, you're young, you're 25 years old. And you said you've been gaming, you started gaming in high school. Yep. Yep. So I, um, as most people, I played the traditional Monopoly, Hi Ho Cheerio, um, shoots and ladders growing up, but it was when I was gifted Ticket to Ride by my aunt that I was like, wow, games have really evolved. And, you know, like I just really enjoyed the game and it, it was just something that I really gravitated towards and it just kind of snowballed from there. Now I have, uh, like 160 board games. I game at least once a week, if not more. Uh, and it's just been, you know, my number one hobby ever since. Well, when I was a retailer, we would refer to you as a customer, as a tastemaker or an alpha gamer, someone who had their finger on the pulse of the industry, but was also, I guess today, what your generation would refer to as an influencer. You were someone who proselytized the hobby. And that was always fascinating to me. Once you discovered the hobby, were you immediately passionate in a standard bearer? Or did it take time for you to sort of find your legs after you got gifted that copy of Ticket to Ride? Yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say there maybe it was a, uh, a slow burn. But once I found a consistent group and people to play games with where I wasn't having, having to beg my parents to play with me. No, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, whenever I was gifted that game, once I found a consistent group, I mean... There was no turning back. I really, you know, just loved exploring different themes and different kinds of games. And it felt like there was just so much new coming to the hobby, you know, like rolling rights and all these mechanics I have never, that I had never played before. It was just like, just awesome discovering all these little games that you know, I had never heard about before and new ones were constantly coming out too. So it wasn't even like the games that were released and I had never heard about like Ticket to Ride and Catan. But then you have a market, right? The board game industry, which just all of a sudden started releasing a ton of games with Kickstarter and everything else. So what was the game then? So you play Ticket to Rider. That's, that's your sort of gateway into, I don't want to say alternate 
board gaming, but, you know, essentially going beneath the surface, right? So you've seen the tip of the iceberg, and now you've taken a dive underneath the water. What was what was the first thing that just marveled you, right? The first thing that you were like, I got to play this again now. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I had never really played a social deduction game until like Secret Hitler and Werewolf. That's just like a completely different experience than anything I had ever played with like a, a simple roll and move game. Once I experienced just that different mechanic, I mean, it was just like something I craved. Like, what's the new mechanic? What's the a new theme I can explore? And using like tools like board game geek to just go into this vortex of like, if you like this, you'll love this. If you like, you know, and it just is a never ending. So do you have a a preference, right? Do you have a a game style or a thematic that, or are make up the bulk of your collection or the things that you really, really like? I would say I gravitate more towards theme than mechanics. Okay. I know you're not supposed to judge a book or a board game by its cover, but oh, like, I'm totally guilty. But yeah, like the artwork and the theme, like I like, I love realistic themes. So like dropping off cargo or, you know, escaping, I know escaping a temple is a little fantasy, but like things I can relate to, you know, where you're, you're delivering packages or you're, so I really gravitate towards the theme as opposed to the mechanics of a game. I'm really drawn in by box art and themes that I can relate to. I definitely would categorize myself as like a medium, medium light gamer. I'm not one who wants to spend four hours on one game. Like I love the fact that we can have a game night and I touched and played five different games that night. I played a couple roll and rights. We played a one hour game of Merlin. Like I like games where I can, you know, move on to the next one, but still have a feeling of satisfaction. Yeah. A lot of gamers like to, uh, I, I, I don't know why, but I've been on this kick correlating gaming to, to food, right? And a lot of people like to eat tapas. They want small plates. They want turn and burn. They want to try different things. And then other people want like that massive seven course meal. They want to sit down and they want to play a Twilight Imperium. And I just assume put a hot poker into my eye. But the thing that you say about, uh, about aesthetic and about appearance, I also think it's important. I feel like such a jerk. For the longest time, I wouldn't play Gloomhaven because the aesthetic is just... I don't want to go so far as to say repellent, but the art to me is very, very unattractive. But god damn if that game's not brilliant. I mean, it's brilliant. Oh, yeah, and I think a lot of people would agree with you there. And But I am guilty of what you're explaining, too. You know, it's like, if I am interested in a game or someone maybe mentions, like, hey, Aaron, I think you'd like this, check this out. I mean, the first thing you see, right, are those production photos or the box art or the card, you know, artwork, what have you. And if it's something that is immediately jarring to me, like, it's going to be hard to win me over then. You know, like, the artwork is what pulls you in. And usually it's it, it, it tells you right away what the theme is like, right, right off the bat. And again, I'm really interested in theme of games. So usually right away I can figure out whether it's for me or not. What's been your biggest surprise? What have you What have you played where you've been like, I did not expect that to blow my socks off, but it did. Yeah, so um, a friend of mine actually introduced to me smart smartphone ink, which is like an economic sort of game where you're like trying to buy phones at smart prices and then sell them to like China and Asia. And the artwork is horrible. I mean, like there is no artwork. There's <laughs> The cover is, I guess, attractive, but like when you look at the board, it just seems so bland. But, uh, I actually ended up winning the game, which doesn't happen very often. Um, I don't usually play to win. I'm more like, I just love the experience. It was just a really fun game and I don't have a lot of economic games. So again, it was kind of a new mechanic for me. That was one that surprised me because right away I was like, Oh gosh, this looks really heavy, which again, I'm not a super heavy gamer. Like I wouldn't play like a, really complicated game that like burns my brain but there was something about it that definitely it it was not as I thought it was going to be you just said that you often don't win the game but that's not the reason that you play right now as on the nose as this is my show is called why we game now you said you play for the experience what about 
the experience, especially if it's not tied to victory, which I'm with you. I'm the same. I'm a similar gamer. Where's your enjoyment coming from if it's not the pursuit of conquest? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, there's something about sitting around a table, having face-to-face interaction with either your best buddies or people you don't even know. And it's just so easy to like just interact with people and like um, put down barriers with it as well. And it's also a chance for me to like put my computer down, my, my screens down, my phone down and really just unplug that just video games can't give you that it doesn't necessarily give you that face to face interaction. And even if I don't win, a lot of times you still feel like you accomplished something like, Oh, I tested out this sort of strategy or this method, but it was, you know, it was entertaining still at the same time, even though that so-and-so got two more points than me. Like it's not, you know, I was able to accomplish something or accomplish a goal or, uh, and maybe it wasn't the best strategy, but it still was satisfying in that regard. So out of all of the games that I'm looking at in your game room, and it is quite nice, right? You have this beautiful banner behind us uh, from your from your book, For the Love of Board Games, which we'll get to. But out of all of the board games in this room and the shelves behind you, which is the one that if – which what's the game where – you're not going to tell me, no, I'd rather play X or Y. Like if I pull the game off the shelf and you're going to say every time it's a yes, put it on the table. That's so hard because I mean, I am, you know, always trimming down my collection. Like I'm not one where it's like, oh, I love this game at one point, And even though this other game I have now kind of replaces it, I still want to keep it. Like I'm not that person. Like I'll sell games while they're still, you know, popular in some sense and trade them out. Um, So that's a hard question for me, but I mean, just one that comes right off the top of my head is Tobago. I mean, it's a game that a lot of people haven't heard of. I am unfamiliar, so please. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Tobago is basically a treasure hunting deduction game. If you've ever played Cryptid, it's kind of like reverse deduction. So like you're actually determining where the treasure is. But the production value is awesome. The artwork is great. Like, it has actually these little stone, like, uh, kind of Easter Island uh, statues. And so the components are awesome. I love kind of puzzly deduction games. I have a ton of them in my collection. But it's one that is a, it's an easier barrier to entry than some other games I have. And um, it feels different every single time I play it. Now, when you were in high school, was there a gaming club or a group of people with whom you gamed? There wasn't a gaming club. You know, I had a friend group that they were just in the dark about board games as much as I was at the time. And I introduced them to games like Wits and Wagers and kind of... Uh, I guess more modern uh, party games or like Werewolf. What yeah, we you gave about. them the great the great gateway games, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and so I introduced them to games like that, and they enjoyed it as equally as I did. And, but I didn't have necessarily a a, a club at school, but kind of in, introduced a lot of my friends to the hobby as I was kind of learning about it as well. Do you mind talking about? being a woman in gaming. And the the reason I ask is that I'm a middle-aged, doughy, Midwestern white guy, and the hobby has really, really evolved since I was a child and certainly evolved since its inception. But you're a 25-year-old woman. You're a very avid gamer. You're a published author. I am curious. I know that when I was 25, the experience for a woman in the hobby both personally and professionally, would be different than it is today. Did you experience coming into the hobby any resistance because of being female? No, I didn't because, again, I was playing with people I was already friends with. But then when I, um, you know, graduated college and was looking for a consistent group because my friends, you know, were uh, not as close geographically and, I wanted to play more than just party games, right? Like, I wanted to dust off those strategy games that I was so excited to play and, you know, couldn't get my family to play. So that's when I actually started my own club um, at a local store, Miniature Market. And so it wasn't really hard. You know, there wasn't any resistance because I started it. And, you know, we had some consistent nights and I met uh, a lot of different people. Um 
And so it wasn't like I was walking into a club where there was always like, like established members or anything. Like I created something, the group grew. And so to answer your question, no, I haven't necessarily felt any resistance. So when you, when you go to a board game convention, like board game geek or Gen Con, uh, you're, gen- you're received well then people don't, people don't meet you with, well, you're a girl, so you think X or Y, or you're not really bona fide in this hobby. Yeah, and I'm, I I have not experienced that, but it's not to say that other females haven't. You know, I think it's pretty clear that for a long time it was a male-dominated industry, and there's still more males than there are females, I would say, in the hobby. Um, but no, I haven't experienced that, um, and I've been lucky, you know, to not. But yeah, no, I've, I've been, I felt like I've had open arms to this hobby because I go out and seek it, right? I haven't had to knock on the door and like ask permission to join this and this. I've kind of just created a group around me, uh, and kind of started a ripple rather than going to established. And see, I think that's the way to go, right? So I have this, I have this theory and it's still very, very young. I don't even know what a fledgling theory, if there's a scientific word for it, but yeah, I'm a generation two gamer, right? I'm in my forties. I grew up gaming, but I grew up gaming in a time where the progenitors of gaming were old grognard Midwestern war gamers who then became role players and then begot my generation and then the next generation. But now at 25, it's wonderful to see that you're not experiencing an impediment to join the hobby. Now, I don't think the hobby is actively going out and seeking diversity, but I at least think that we're, we've, we've come up to that barrier and overcome the impediment where it is resisting entry of people who, uh, that may have been seen as other, you know, but I'm, I'm glad that that, you've had a good experience with it because that scares me. Well, and like you said, there was war gaming. Then there was like D and D like role playing. Now there's just like so many possibilities. I mean, there is a theme for everyone. There is a game for everyone, whether it's your grandma or your aunt or someone who's been gaming for 50 years, but has only played the same card game, you know, over and over and over again. Like that's the thing is like, I've never played a game of D and D. I've never played a war game, but I consider myself a gamer because, you know, I play the traditional board games, strategy games that, you know, last an hour to two hours or even just 10, 30 minutes, which is safe to say there wasn't as many options, say 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30, 30 years ago. Um, and I don't know if I would have been a gamer back then because Maybe they're, you know, I don't think I would have gravitated towards war games and D and D. It's just that's not the type of gamer I am. If that makes sense, it does. It does. So personally, for me, narrative is the enjoyment, right? Like I love to play a game, say Race for the Galaxy, and I pay almost no attention to what the other people are doing because I'm literally building a narrative as I'm drafting tiles and I'm trying to get my little engine going, but. I, 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 I literally would be challenged to, to, to care less about what the others are doing. Now, for you, the experience is, is it the narrative? Is it, you know, or is it delving into the, the, the not, cause the mechanics you said were not your thing. What about the experience keeps you coming back? Cause for me, every game's a different story, right? Every single time I play a race for the galaxy, it's different. Every time I play castles of Burgundy, I'm building a different castle and have a different thing going on with the architects and the contractors in my head, which makes me sound like a fucking crazy person. But for, for you, there's an experience that you keep going back to. And what is that? Yeah, I think, I think the experience I keep going back to is like you said, every game feels different. Uh, it's a chance to socialize with other human beings, um, in a fun kind of puzzly way, whether we're working together or against each other, doesn't matter. Do you like problem solving? I do. I do. So um, let me ask, and I know this is a bit tangential. What did you do hobby wise before you got into board games? I was a big video gamer. 
So oh, okay. I grew up with a lot of Nintendo games. You know, my first console was a 64, then GameCube, then... And I still play video games sometimes, but not nearly as much as I do now. Now I'm definitely a board gamer first, video gamer second. And I think it's because of the face-to-face socialization I get with board games. Like, I've been a gamer, like, my whole life, I've, but there's something about the board game experience that keeps me coming back. May I float something by you? I, uh, I mean, again, I, I'm generally an, an angry person because I'm a, a middle-aged white man. I, I take umbrage with video gamers using the word gamer, right? Because OG gamers, tabletop gamers, Avalon Hill gamers, chit gamers, board gamers, role players, I feel like, and, and again, this is, it's elitist and exclusionary, but I feel like that the word gamer belongs to people who do analog and that video gamers need another word. Now, I, I, it makes me sound like a jerk, but I don't know. I just, I, I hate when they use that word. It, it feels like it's our word. <laughs> well, and I think they may feel the same exact way when you hear like, oh, my so-and-so friend is a gamer. I feel like sometimes people's first reaction is video games oh, when they sure. hear that. Um, so that's why I say board gamer versus, you know, I just throw in that word, uh, you know, prior to game gamer, but, um, yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's a different medium. It's a different feel. Yeah. Does your partner game? Yes. Yeah. So he is, that's the thing is like, I would definitely say I'm more on the board gaming side and he's more on the video gaming side, but there's still aspects of video gaming that I still enjoy. And there's some aspects of uh, board gaming he enjoys. Like, he definitely does not board game as much as I do, and I don't video game as much as him. But I think there is some crossover to just kind of that um, spending your time in that manner. Does he participate in your weekly game group games? No. So that's something you guys do diff- separate. Mm-hmm. Which I think is healthy, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I certainly, I mean, I've been with the same woman for, uh, Jesus, God, we've been married for 19 years, but we've been together since 1992. So, I mean, we need time apart. Yeah, yeah. You need you need your thing. <laughs> she needs her thing. Um, no, I totally agree. I mean, it's it's definitely something I look forward to each week to, you know, see some different faces and... I work remote full time right now, just given the pandemic. So it's just a great way to use my house, um, not just as a workplace, but as an entertaining thing. So, um, but yeah, no, that's a totally, it's my thing. It's something I look forward to. And it's, yeah, to answer your question. Let's talk about you as an author. Got a copy of your book here for The Love of Board Games, where you interview some pretty significant names in the hobby industry. What was the genesis of the book? How did you decide, you know what, I love board games, I love participating in this hobby, I I, I genuinely value the social experience, I want to meet some of the other people who design these games and who drive this industry. What was the genesis of that? When I started working on the book a couple years ago, it was just something that I saw that the industry needed at the time. Like, obviously, their Kickstarter had already taken off. You know, Exploding Kittens was already a thing. Games were getting funded. But I didn't really see any books about the hobby that weren't like, I don't know, maybe just the history of gaming or... I just, I felt like it was something that the market needed and it was something that, you know, I love interviewing people. I was a video production major and my focus was kind of on the producing side. So interviewing people, kind of um, being the person behind the scenes, asking the questions, kind of driving where the story goes. Um, so not only taking my number one passion, board games, but then being able to meet and ask questions to some of the most prolific designers of our time was just something that once I thought of it, I just kind of ran with it. But you decided in your early 20s that you were going to do a book, an interview book about board games. And you got people like Richard Garfield to agree to talk to you for an interview. That's amazing for somebody in general, but certainly somebody who'd never done it before and who who was so young. So what was 
What was your process like reaching out to these people? I have to say that selfishly, I'm fascinated because I, if you've got a, a, a trick in in a thing that I can learn, that's amazing. But I mean, shit, I don't know if I have the testicular fortitude to reach out to somebody who's a big deal like Richard Garfield and say, because I'm nobody, right? I, will you please talk to me? So that's, I mean, the the courage, super respect. Yeah, no, it was just kind of like a mission I embarked on. Like, I, I remember creating a Google Doc way in kind of the early stages of it. Like, okay, these are the designers I want to go after. And I think there was like over 50 names. Like, I, I some of them I weren't wasn't even necessarily aware of. It was like, oh, I love this game and this game. Oh, this came out of the same person, was designed by the same person. So I kind of tackled it that way. Here's the list. You know, do I have to go drum up their board game geek username and send them a message on there? Do I have to find their email on their publishing website? Uh, a lot of the contacts I got was I interviewed three designers and they gave me six more designers emails. And, you know, I just kind of had a little log and kind of just kept chipping away at it. You just it. hustled. You just yeah. did the work. That's yeah. fantastic. So which one out of all the interviews in your book? Which one was your biggest surprise that they agreed to talk to you? I mean, yeah, I mean, Richard Garfield was definitely a big one, as you mentioned. Reiner Kaninzia mm -hmm. was a big name, too, yeah. that, I mean, almost everyone knows him. I mean, it, he's created hundreds and hundreds of games, and we actually did, and not all interviews were done via, like, Skype or, like, um, a, a conferencing link. Some of them were just audio, but we actually got on a face-to-face video chat me and him him over in you know germany or wherever the heck he is um and it just felt kind of like an out-of-body experience it was just really neat and um i was able to talk to people all over the world you know i even uh contacted do you know the game onitama oh yeah yeah so i even was able to talk to someone and have someone translate for me where i just i asked them some questions and he got back to me with his translator. Like, it was just so cool. Like, I got, I, I literally talked to people on, like, almost all the continents, which is just, like, nuts. It was just a really cool experience. You crowdfunded via Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as I was kind of working on all these interviews, right, kind of the content of the book, um, I, I started building up, like, my mailing list and, like, involving others in the process as far as hey here's four cover ideas for the book what do you think is the coolest and it not even being people that had heard about it like I just kind of gave like a I just kind of gave a brief summary of the book like hey it's going to be a book full of interviews of your favorite board game designers here are the covers I'm looking at you know I would say hey I interviewed these 10 designers which 10 more should I do um, and slowly I started building you know like a mailing list of a thousand two thousand people to have day one of when the Kickstarter launched that people who had, you know, seen my post on different board game Facebook groups or that I talked to physically at my local board game store. So we, you know, funded day one. I think my goal was like, I don't even know. It's been so long. It was less than 20,000 and we ended up at like 59K wow. at the end of it. Wow. That's fantastic. So was that stressful um, succeeding to that degree? It was exciting. I mean, no one could believe it. Like just in my, you know, family, it was just like, I was just hoping to hit that number as a lot of Kickstarter people who do Kickstarters are trying to do. And when we just kind of blew it out of the water, it was just a very humbling experience and, you know, even drove me more to just try to make it the best it could. And by that point, I had already really done all the interviews. I was working with an editor to kind of tweak some of the formatting stuff. Yeah, no, it was it was surreal. Who did you use to publish? Yeah, so I just used kind of like uh, a self-author publishing site. It's called Book Baby. Actually, one of the designers I interviewed gave me the suggestion for that site, uh, Jeff Engels Engelstein or Engelstein. He um, has designed several games and he ha himself had done some books, but more on like kind of game theory, game mechanics stuff for like beginning designers. And that's what he used for his book. So then I looked into it and got pricing and ended up just doing that. So it was self-published. 
behind me on the wall is some incredible art. Um, really, really beautiful. Because you had said something uh, that perhaps you were going to pursue doing a second book. Do you mind talking about that? Yeah, absolutely. So after the first book, I believe it ended in like the, in a September, like late September. And then that following spring, I had the idea, okay, this the first book went so well. What I want to do is create a board game artwork coffee table book featuring some of the best artwork we've seen in the past decade and interview some of the artists like where does you, how did you begin working in the board game industry? What how would you describe well, your art style? Forgive me for sounding pandering, but that's a wonderful idea and the artwork, who's the artist again? Uh, so the the picture you're referring to on the wall uh, was going to be the cover of this second book, and it's by Andrew Bosley, who's an up-and-coming uh, board game artist. He's done Everdell, countless other games. He's really making a splash. Yeah, no, it's, it is truly, and I'm assuming that's the original? Yes. That's spectacular. Yes. I, I have great envy. That, that, that art is beautiful. So anyway, so you were talking about doing a coffee table art book, and... I think it's a great idea. I think there's a tremendous amount of just spectacular art out there. Where are you at on that project? Yeah, so it kind of got derailed. Um, you know, I had already hired a graphic design firm. They were putting together all the art pieces. And it like, whereas my first book was very interview heavy, this was going to be artwork first, interview second. You know, the artwork, uh, the interview was going to just kind of be flavor to the amazing beautiful pieces that some of these board game artists had created, but it kind of got derailed when um, I was working with a publisher and they backed out and I knew how much work had gone into self-publishing, you know, with my experience with the first book. And I just didn't want to take that on again. And the way it ended as far as the publisher agreement, uh, it was just, you know, a lot of just kind of frustration and it, it wasn't like a, easy parting. So I, I just decided to take a break um, and let that project sit for a bit. And it's, it's been there since. If someone wants to get for the love of board games, if they wanted to, if they hear this interview and they want to get your book, where would they get it at? I used to have an active website where people could purchase it on. Um, nowadays I still do have copies. I haven't done like additional print runs or anything. So I think you can get it on like Amazon and miniaturemarket.com. But if you would want to buy it directly from me, you could just shoot me an email, um, at Aaron Dean 100 at yahoo.com, uh, which I don't know if you can put in the show notes, yeah, but absolutely. yeah, that would be the best way. Perfect. And give that to me one more time. Aaron Dean 100 at yahoo.com. And that's, that is E R I N D E A N 100.com. Perfect. Yeah. 100 at yahoo.com. At yahoo.com. Yes. All right. Well, there we go. So I totally, I, I crapped no, the bed there. No. <laughs> You're good. You're good. <laughs> Let's transition then. You said you worked for Genius Games and Lucky Duck Games as well? Yeah. So at the, when the, when I created my first book for the love of board games and launched on Kickstarter, I was at a full time job at the time as a, a project coordinator at a video production company uh, where I'm at. And that book kind of gave me the launch pad to be like, hey, I want to dip my feet into working in the actual board game industry. So that's when I found some work uh, at two different publishers, Lucky Duck Games, which is a Polish board game publisher. I actually just emailed the CEO, told him my like social media plan. He gave me a job where I worked remotely. And then... John Covey of Genius Games, he uh, is local to St. Louis where I'm based out of, um, and he was actually my professor, so that one was easier to win really? over. Yeah. So For which class? He taught a class called um, uh, Traditional Game Design. There is a game design program that leans more towards uh, video games at uh, Webster University, and he taught a board game design class. I was one of his students and we literally just played board games all. I'm like, sign me up. That's easy three credit hours where I get to game, you know? So that's how I met him. So how was the, how was the design class? What was that like? Yeah. So the kind of early stages of the class, we just learned different mechanics, which I was already familiar with at that point. We played like games like Stone Age 
and Catan and Three Rooms and a Boom and all these different games that, you know, kind of showcase different mechanics that board games can have. And then we spent um, kind of the last half of the class creating our own game. So would you reverse engineer games to, to sort of break down how their mechanics work? And That's fascinating. Yeah, no, you're right. I would love note. to audit that. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's exactly what it was. I mean, we we picked apart what, what made the game special, what made it unique, all the, yeah. Well, let me put a pin in design for now. What did you do when you were at Genius Games? Yeah, so I helped John with um, some social media stuff, just different odds and ends he needed help with, with production process. I helped him, like, with some playtesting stuff, just a little bit of everything. I wasn't there super long, but, you know, they're based out of St. Louis where I'm at, so it was a chance for me to, because uh, I was just working part-time at Lucky Duck Games, so it was a way for me to get kind of additional money and additional hours in the industry. Do you have aspirations to become a game designer yourself? That is not something I think I would pursue. It's something that you know, hats off to the people who can make it uh, their living. It's something I've fiddled with before. Um, I was kind of tinkering around with a, a music board game called Face the Music where you'd basically draft different note tiles. And the cool thing about it was going to, you know, you can, there's apps today that you can scan sheet music. So at the end of the game, you would literally create a song and, like, scan it and, like, hear the music you actually created. So that was kind of what I was fiddling around with and play tested with some people. But you don't have a desire to, to do that aspect of it professionally. Would you be happy uh, doing books about board gamings? I mean, I mean, do you want to – do you want to see the second book come to fruition? I think – just because of how the project came to a halt, you know, it, it's it's just been something I haven't wanted to pick up just yet. I'm not to say, because I, I still think it's an amazing idea. I still think it'd be so cool for the hobby to have. But it was just, it was just kind of like it happened, or it ended rather, and I just kind of took a step back like, this isn't meant to be at this time, and I'm just going to let it breathe. Okay, if you could have more impact on the industry as a professional, what would I mean? So, Aaron Dean's got a magic wand. Whatever, whatever job you want in the gaming industry exists. You've created it. You're going to fill it. What would that be? You know, one of the favorite things I've done in the industry is I was a game navigator at a local board game bar and cafe pieces. And I almost, like, if I could make a living from it, if I could literally be a librarian librarian where all it was my job was to suggest games to people and, like, you know, uh, build up a collection and, like, run cl local school club. Like, that would be awesome. Like, introducing people to the hobby just for a living would be amazing. All right. Well, now I'm going to put you on the spot, so please forgive me, but correct me if I'm wrong, but... Didn't you have an idea that you floated some time ago about a museum? Yeah, yeah, my gosh. Because that, I mean, that's that's the coolest fucking thing I've ever heard, right? Yeah. The only thing that would make me make it the perfect idea is that if just like facets of the hobby, there were different wings or avenues, rooms of said museum dedicated to here's board gaming, here's collectible card gaming. This is the time when collectible card gaming transitioned into living card games. You know, that, I would love it. Yeah, no, that was something that I, again, I, I love looking at something, like something I'm passionate about, like the board game industry, and what is it missing? That's where all my ideas have come from. Oh, it's missing a book of interviews of the greatest designers. Oh, it's missing a coffee table book of board game artwork. Why don't we have, there's, why are there five video game museums in the U.S. and none no board game museums, like that sort of thing. That's just kind of where my ideas have no, it's, come it's, from. It's a wonderful, wonderful idea. I know that uh, Joseph Goodman from Goodman Games, he's a, a role-playing guy, but he's put forth a lot of effort to preserve the history of the role-playing game industry, particularly Dungeons & Dragons. But I just, I, 
and I know there's not a lot of money in this industry, but the idea that a person such as yourself would put forth the effort to organize and curate some sort of history for the hobby. I'm just, I'm so afraid that because it's analog and everything's paper that it's going to get lost at some point. Yeah. And I mean, there, there is a huge collection, uh, at the National Museum of Play, if I'm not mistaken, in Rochester, New York, where they have a huge collection of vintage board games. It's definitely not their main focus by any means. You know, which is crazy. I mean, there's museums dedicated to mustard. Why can't there be, you know, museums dedicated to board games, solely dedicated to board games and, you know, role-playing games? But I I, I, I share that fear, right? Because board games are physical and, you know, it, someone's got to preserve it. Some Someone's got to take that, you know, initiative. I have this fantasy that I wish some, you know, crazy billionaire would just, you know, come into the gaming industry and say, hey, I just want to preserve some Willy Wonka type nut bag and just dump money into it. Exactly. I mean, that that's the thing is with a museum there there. I mean, it's just you need so much money. It's crazy. But yeah, no, I, I, I think that'd be great if someone came in and had the had the money to drive that initiative. When you were writing your book, what was your what was your discipline like? What what was your schedule like? Did you set aside time every day where I am going to, you know, two hours every day after dinner, I'm gonna write? Yeah, so the way the book is structured, it was mainly interviews. So it wasn't like a ton of like, you know, like a, what a non uh, you know, or like a, what a fiction book would require, for example. Right. It's basically taking what we're doing and putting it to print. Exactly. So uh, when I started working on the book, I was actually a full-time student. So again, kind of my attack plan was here are the designers I want to go after. And all of them were in different stages, right? Where I've made contact. We've scheduled an interview. Okay, we've we've done the interview. Now I need to translate it into text. Like all of you know, there was certain parts or certain designers that were at different stages. So really it was just, I, I didn't necessarily set aside specific time each week, but I was definitely moving towards just progress every single day. How long did it take you from conception to completion? I think it was like a semester. Like, That's it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, and... It's a lot of it, I mean, the interview, the contents of the book itself, I mean, that it probably took a semester, but then there's, we edited the book after it was funded. So that took additional resources and all of that. But like the heart of the book was created in just the span of like five, six months. Did you make money from the pro from the project? Yeah, I did. Um, now, see, that's know. the way. That's the way to go, right? Yeah. Is to, I mean, to if you're going to do it and truly be professional, right? You want to make a product that consumers purchase, and you want to have a little, uh, a little bit of profit at the end of the day. Yeah, no, there was some profit, um, but obviously the majority of the funds went towards the actual printing and shipping of the books. I mean, that took a huge chunk of it. So what that I think shipping and fulfillment is probably at least was the largest mistake that people made. Um, can we talk about the Kickstarter process and how that went for you? Yeah, of course. Because I'm curious. I've never done a Kickstarter. So, I mean, I could go to Kickstarter and set up an account, but what was the project launch and the project management like for you now and it sounds like with your professional background you've got a you've got a, a bit of a an edge over most of us right because it's what you do for a living but you know managing projects but how did that go what was i mean i think the first thing i mean once the once it was like a well thought out project i built up my mailing list right i wanted to have an audience on day one who knew about it was excited about it so kind of just the marketing and spreading the word, um, actually building the Kickstarter page. So all the graphics and creating the Kickstarter video. We did do some like promotional images where we took some of the most prolific designers and turned them into characters of their most popular games. So like Richard Garfield as a Magic the Gathering character or Jamie Stegmeier as 
one of the the vineyard, you know, uh, family members or what have you. So we did that. Then it's just, you know, getting to the funding goal and releasing updates and stretch goals. What did you do for stretch goals? We un- with, a, with a book, that's challenging, right? We unlocked a alternative book cover, which was only exclusive to the Kickstarter backers that they didn't have to pick the alternative cover, but they were the only ones who were going to get. But like, if you if you did what I did and you bought it from your FLGS, you got the standard cover. Exactly, okay. exactly. So it was mostly like having your name in the back of the book, bookmark, like a free bookmark, like things like that. I mean, it's not a game, so it's not like you can upgrade components and like. But um, we did do some fun things, and we even like you know like oh if we reach this then we'll do an hour live stream with uh, Matt Leacock where you can ask questions. It'll just be exclusive for our. And Matt Leacock is of pandemic fame. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so things like that was kind of the while the Kickstarter was running, and then it became like okay, we need to make because you know you you obviously set a kind of like suggested when it's going to deliver to the backers so then it was just kind of project management right to make sure and did you plot all of those logistics prior to launching the kickstarter i don't know if it was fully fleshed out i mean i think i knew everything as far as who i was going to use for the printing who i was going to use for the shipping who's helping me with the editing i used crowdox for like getting um backer information shipping information um what is crowd ox so it's like it's basically i mean i think it's basically like a crowd funder management uh, there's other ones lo- that the names are escaping me but crowd ox basically it's where surveys can go out of it backers can answer and give you know shipping information i think kickstarter has some built in but it's not really that great especially when you have like oh you need to choose what cover you want and things of those nature, uh, of that nature. It's a lot easier to manage it on like a, a software that's specifically designed to handle those, those things. And was your printing done overseas? No, it was done locally. Wow. Or not locally. I mean, it was domestically. done domestically. Yes. Well, that's good to hear. So, and, and that was cost effective for you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say it was the most cost effective, you know, option out there, but it definitely seemed the most Because I was doing all this by myself, right? It's not like I had, you know, a team of 10 people who do this for a living, you know, creating games and things for the board gaming hobby. So I just wanted to do, you know, not only, I guess, good pricing, but like just easy to manage, you know. And the fact that I'd be working with someone super far away for printing needs and shipping things overseas, like that just kind of... For me, it's a matter of communication, you know, I mean, if I spoke, if I spoke Mandarin, I would absolutely do my publishing overseas, yeah. but I don't. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Same here. Yeah. Same here. And that just seemed really daunting right. to me. So it's like, yes, maybe I could save some dollars, but I mean, that's just an unknown for me. And it, again, it was my first pr- crowdfunding project ever. So I wanted to be able to like be confident in those sorts of things. And then you used Miniature Market did your fulfillment, right? Yeah, yeah. So I had um, chatted with the owner of Miniature Market, Steve, and he, again, it was something that, hey, the shipping is in my hometown sort of thing. Like it was uh, something I could easily manage and keep an eye on and keep track of. And he was able to give me some rights that I was comfortable with. And we went from there. What about the process then? was too much work was it the combination of everything together or was there one facet where you were just like this element was too much i think the most stressful project was after the books were shipped out and people are like i didn't receive my book and it's never arrived and it said it was delivered here like that logistical nightmare was like just super stressful and enough time has passed that those kind of requests aren't really, or inquiries aren't really happening anymore. But it was, I mean, it felt like an email, like all the time. If someone, you know, a backer was emailing me because I, I did ha I did ship internationally to some specific places, so that 
it was kind of, especially for just a one woman show, it was just kind of like, oh my God, this is a lot. Yeah. And I've heard people say on more than one occasion that if you do a Kickstarter, don't do international fulfillment for the variety of headaches that happen on the shipping end of things and, and cost calculation, you know, generally people mess that up. Oh, for sure. For sure. I think, um, yeah, it was definitely easily the most stressful part of the process. So how did you calculate shipping then? I mean, you knew obviously how much the books weighed and then how much packing material was going to go into each book. Yeah. So we used USPS or I think it was, I don't know if we did FedEx International and then USPS for just domestic, but I was able to work with the owner of Miniature Market and look at some rates and figure out the most cost effective options. But I, I agree with a lot of people where it's just like, if you don't have, if you don't want to deal with that, don't, because it is a big headache. So where do you see the industry going? I mean, obviously you, you're a lifer, right? I mean, this is your, you're in, this is what you're going to do. So when you're my age in 20 years, what do you think the industry is going to look like? That's hard to say, but I really do feel like more and more people are just going to be introduced to the hobby. It's just going to become more mainstream. And I'm sure you've seen over the years, it's become less and less niche. And, you know, Gen Con is already, you know, overflowing into the stadium and, you know, attendee numbers are skyrocketing. And I think once people get introduced and they play that gateway game with, you know, the gamer in their life or what have you, you know, I think it's just going to become more and more common that you're going to run into board gamers and people that, you know, are into it. Yeah, it's just going to be a thing that you do, right? Where you see somebody wearing a wood for sheep t-shirt down the street, it's no different than seeing somebody wearing a blues jersey or, or, or whatever. Yeah, no. And I think it's going to become even more crucial because, you know, obviously our screen time increases with every year and more advanced technology is coming out that I think people are just going to crave oh, you're analog right. gaming you're, more you're, and more. You I'm know? sorry to interrupt you. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. You're absolutely right. And I think it's, you know, as people become more addicted and, you know, technology keeps becoming more mainstream in people people's lives, when they're introduced to board gaming, it's just going to feel like, just so, such a relieving experience, you know, to be away from that. Yeah, I mean, I have seen over when I was working as a retailer, watching the industry, particularly the board game aspect of it, explode more so than other aspects of it. Uh, because I think people, as you pointed out, I think people crave that interaction, right? I think that there is a backlash against those screens. I, I think my generation saw it. I think you're, as you predict, you think your generation's going to see it, uh, see it again, that it's just going to keep going and growing, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what is really sucked about this pandemic is a lot of people are, their only option is to play board games, you know, quote unquote, you know, virtually, whether that's, you know, through stream, you know, like Zoom calls or conference calls where you have like a webcam on the game or you result, you know, you play on like board game arena, which has like kind of a, a digital version of the board game online. So, it, it, and people, it's, it's just such a different experience for sure. All right. So last question I have for you, what is, cause obviously you pay attention to what's coming, right? What's coming down the pike that you're stoked for, right? That you're just super excited for. I think the game I'm most excited about coming out is Honey Buzz, which is a local design. It's uh, this guy named Paul, who's actually from St. Louis. Uh, it's coming from Elf Creek Games, which is a Champaign, Illinois publisher. And the production quality just looks awesome. There's like tile placement and you're kind of building up your hive. It's a theme that I think is neat. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited because the production quality is off the charts and the gameplay looks really solid from what I've seen. El Elf Creek. And again, I might have to cut this out of the episode, but Elf Creek, are they the people that did Atlantis Rising? The yep. Yep. Have you played that? Yeah, I own oh, it. Yeah. It's oh a great. Oh my God, it's so good. Yeah. It's a great cooperative game, um, which I mean, they haven't been a publisher for that long. Right. I had they, no idea they were in Illinois. 
Yeah. Well, that's a hot, that's a hot tip, Aaron. Thank you because I'm going to reach out to them. I didn't realize they were within driving distance. Yeah. No, they're in Champaign and they only have a few games under their belt, but every game they've put out so far, I mean, the production quality and just the gameplay quality is like off the charts. Gotcha. So, so Honey Buzz, what's our, what's our theme there? So basically you are, it's kind of like a bee, beehive that you're building up. There's engine building and tile placement. You know, it's just like the production quality. I mean, you just got to see pictures online to believe it. It just looks so beautiful, so colorful. Many reviews, reviewers who have seen the preview copies, I mean, the gameplay checks out too. So it's one I'm definitely going to be purchasing when it comes out here in a month and a month or two. Excellent. Well, Aaron Dean, author of For the Love of Board Games. If someone wants to buy your book, again, that's Aaron Dean 100 at yahoo.com, or you can get it from miniaturemarket.com, Amazon, etc. It has been really a pleasure talking to you, Aaron. It's wonderful to see someone so young and enthusiastic and to know that the hobby is in good hands going forward so it's just it was a pleasure thank you yeah thank you mike and it's uh yeah i completely agree and it's been it's been great thanks so much wiley game is a production of the influence foundation all rights reserved audio editing by brodor music by owen godwin